Teaching American History, a look at New York City. Follow in the footsteps of our country's forefathers with a group of history teachers from the Florida Panhandle as they take an up-close-and-personal look at the historic events, people, and places that have shaped our nation. Join our history teachers as they tour throughout New York City. Some of the destinations in this tour include the Empire State Building, Fort Amsterdam, the New York Stock Exchange, and Central Park. This video concludes with a visit to the five-year World Trade Center Memorial and an interview with a New York City Fire Chief from Battalion 9. Teaching American History to raise student achievement by improving teachers' knowledge, understanding, and skills in teaching American history. through Times Square as you look uh, up and down either uh, sideways here in either of the streets you can see where all the Broadway theaters are. Uh, they line the streets basically between Broadway which is what we're on and 8th Avenue, the next avenue over on the right side of the bus and all the streets in between between 42nd and about 52nd. You guys were at the northern reaches. You were about the, the northernmost theaters here uh, in, in Times Square to see uh, Hairspray. Over here on the right side, where all that construction is right there, is where the Tix booth is. The Tix booth normally sits there and has for the last 25 or 30 years. And it's where you buy half-price tickets for your Broadway shows on the day of the show. So these uh, theaters, uh, producers who haven't sold all their tickets, you know, end up and they go, my gosh, we've got, you know, 25% of the house is wide open tonight. How do we get rid of them? Well, they decided about 30 years ago it would be a great idea to just uh, send those blocks of tickets down to a common place. People could show up and say, hey, look, I'll buy them, but I don't want to pay full price. You couldn't sell it yourself. So they agreed that they would sell them for half price plus a little fee. So it's a, it's a really wonderful tradition for New Yorkers to go up to the Ticks booth and um, just walk right up. I can walk up at quarter to eight and still buy a reasonably good ticket for lots and lots of Broadway shows for that night and go to the show 15 minutes later. So, um, one of the fun things about New York. Um, something else about New York is that is it's a very expensive city, and yet at the same time, a very inexpensive city. Because whenever there's this much money around, you can take advantage of the fact that uh, so much of that just sort of gets trickled down. Uh, for example, with fashion, you know, you pay $1,000 for a suit, uh, six months later it's on sale for $400. You know, there's so many places where uh, you just can have great value, uh, great values. Uh, food is one thing. You can pay $400 for a tasting menu up at Per Se, for example, or Masa. But you can also get an incredible meal for $20, you know, at any one of a number of incredible restaurants in New York. So uh, it, 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 everything is relative here. Over here on the right side, I think they're setting up for, uh, for Broadway on Broadway. What is it in there? 
Bubba Gump. Oh, Bubba, yes, one of our one of our great cultural establishments. Bubba Gump. There's the Paramount building where it says Hard Rock, and the Paramount is the building where all the movie studios had their offices. Paramount primarily. But that's where, of course, Frank Sinatra sang back during the 1940s. The Paramount Theater was one of the great vaudeville houses of all time. And it was said that if you played the Paramount, you had really come a long way. So let's see. Uh, we're on an island, Manhattan, named New York, New York. Now, we have a state called New York, obviously. We have a city called New York. And the city is five boroughs. Each of the boroughs is also a county in the state. Interestingly enough, usually a county in our, in our neck of the woods, you know, there might be a couple of cities in the county. Here, each borough of New York is a separate county so that the state can kind of keep track. And it's because there are eight million people in these five boroughs. Uh, now, New York City itself, which is what we call Manhattan, New York, New York, everything else is Bronx or Queens or Staten Island or, you know, um, uh, Brooklyn. New York, uh, Manhattan is the only one that we can call New York. So uh, when you say New York, you can mean one of three things, Manhattan itself, New York City, the five boroughs, or New York State. So we continue down here along Broadway. Now, remember I said that this is the world's largest grid that you're on. In 1811, the uh, commissioners sat around and they said, we have a feeling this place is going to explode. This is going to be a big deal someday. And they decided then to take this very hilly island and basically flatten it fill in all the streams and swamps, knock down as many of the hills that they could, and simply put in avenues going north and south and streets going east and west at 90 degree angles, that these avenues and streets would simply have numbers, not names. Very easy for the immigrants to get around that way. They didn't have to speak the language. You knew if you were working at 33rd and 3rd, it was very easy to look at a map or you could simply walk. You could see the numbers, no problem. So it was meant to be, you know, for the for the masses, for the populace, and um, uh, so that grid went in, and they presumed that the whole city was basically going to be just single-family houses, and, and this would be great because it would establish all these blocks. It was like the huge, you know, a huge subdivision. They just figured 13 miles that way, two and a half miles this way, nothing but blocks, and we'll just have houses, and people will be very happy. Well, little did they know that. That spurred such economic development because now you have these blocks so you could sell lots. I tell you, the Empire State Building is a uh, very impressive, uh, tallest structure in New York City, and uh, just a smorgasbord of lights outside, and uh, it's worth a trip up here just to see that and to admire the, the beauty that man has made. And uh, it looks like a big Christmas tree out there. Just lights and lights and lights and tall buildings, lots of concrete, but we've had a great time. My first impression of New York is one that uh, there's a lot of people, and I, it's where the melting pot of the world, I guess, is here, and the culture and all the sights to see are just, just mind-boggling, actually.
Well, we had a very good dinner tonight, and Italian food was great, and uh, got to shop around a little bit at some of the uh, street vendors around, and it's uh, interesting how to haggle with the street vendors and all, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Plans for tomorrow, we're going to uh, Battery Park, going to Ellis Island, and the highlight of the day, I believe, we'll be going down to uh, Ground Zero to uh, commemorate the fifth anniversary of September 11th. to reiterate a little bit about what I said earlier, this is where it all started. This is the site of the original Fort Amsterdam. You know, the first thing you do when you're a settler, you come someplace, you're fresh new to it, you don't know what's going on, the first thing you do is you build a fort. It's kind of like the castles back in the Middle Ages. You had to build yourself up, get yourself protected, and then you can start to nose around and see what's out there. But man, you wanted to have those four walls around you first. So right here, the site of the Customs House is where that first fort was, Fort Amsterdam. It became various things as the years went by. But, uh, but basically, it started right here. So 1620s, the Dutch are here. They start to build the place up. Little by little, it becomes bigger and bigger. They're making a little bit more money. This is going well. The Dutch are like, eh, all right, we'll keep, we'll keep funding this thing. Um, what are they trading? The beaver skins, beaver furs, and things like that. Um, the place is, as I said, a polyglot. In the first, they suspect that in the first 15 or so years, there were 18 different languages already being spoken on this little island. There were probably 500 settlers and there were 18 languages being spoken. The Dutch were inclusive. The Dutch are very, very uh, much uh, accepting of all sorts of different peoples, all different personalities. Jews were able to come here. Black folks were able to come here. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was remarkable. All these, you know, these uh, Huguenots and all these, a lot of the outcasts of Europe were, were able to come here and they set up shop. Now, one of the problems was that they drank like fish. There wasn't a whole lot to do, and there was a, there was a bar on every corner. And um, so years later, Peter Stuyvesant, as I said before, came up from the ABCs, Aruba and, and uh, Bonaire and Curacao, and the Dutch got him in here to clean up Dodge. He was the fourth governor, and um, he's actually depicted along the way up there. You know, he had that peg leg, old Peter Stuyvesant with his peg leg, but he's the guy that really put the Dutch colony on the map. The Dutch colony was only here for about 40 years. 1620s to about the 1660s. And he had it for the last bunch of years. And he really, he created hospitals, he created schools. Um, he cleaned up a lot of the drinking and a lot of the bars. He was like the real, the real tough father, the real tough love. And uh, really did a marvelous job here. And unfortunately, as I said yesterday, what happens at the end of his reign, the British sail into the harbor. And you've got two superpowers, Dutch, you know, uh, the, the, the Dutch, and you've got the British, the, the major superpowers. This was just a little thing to be battered about. This was just a little pawn in their game of international intrigue. And at one point, they just decided, well, you know what? It makes more sense for Britain to have this little thing called New Amsterdam, so you guys take it for a while. Well, Peter Stuyvesant had worked and worked and worked, and he was Dutch, and he didn't want this to happen. So as I said, he, you know, he ran up and down the street saying, look, the British are in the harbor. Come on out and fight. And people were like, no. We, thanks anyway, we don't think so. Not worth dying over. We don't care whose flag is flying over. We just want to keep making our money. Now, this was true even up until the revolution, right? You could be right next door to someone who was a Tory. You could be, you could be a loyalist. They could be a revolutionary. It depended on, well, let's see. Will I make more money if I join the revolutionaries, or will I make more money if I stay with King George? And people just don't realize that. It wasn't this monolith of people just going, yes, we're going to, no, especially in New York. New Yorkers like, well, maybe, maybe, we'll see. But anyway, so a little bit about the Dutch history. Anyway, this is the, uh, the customs house. This went up in 1902. And uh, long before we had income taxes in this country, most of the federal government was funded by customs taxes. So that's so much of the money came from. That's why such an elaborate structure was built. We're gonna see the, uh, the, the one in a little while that was here before this one, that's now called the Federal Hall Memorial. 
but close to the river, this is where you'd come. You would go in. It was like a huge bank. There's a huge rotunda in there. You'd go up. You'd say, you know, here's how much I'm bringing in. Here's how much I owe you. Thank you very much, government. And uh, off you'd go to sell your goods. So um, this beautiful, uh, beautiful group of sculptures in the front was done by Charles uh, uh, Daniel Chester French, the same guy that did the beautiful uh, a statue of Lincoln down in Washington, D.C. And he represents the four major continents that we were trading with uh, in the form of a woman. And you can see from the other end there, it's a little bit hard, but you can see a sphinx down there, and you can see the woman is falling asleep. That's Africa. She's kind of tired. She's kind of out of it. Not really happening yet. She's going to be a, a source to deal with. Over here, you have the next one over is Europe. That was our most important trading partner. And then us. And you can see a woman up there who looks sort of like Liberty. She's got a torch in her hand. And interestingly enough, there's an American Indian hiding behind her in kind of a submissive pose. And how fascinating to me that now, years later, this is the American Museum of the American Indian. So I think that's kind of fun that <laughs> there's, there's this poor submissive Indian behind Lady Liberty. And now this is the museum that celebrates the native cultures. And back over here, we have a woman, and you can see her. She's kind of meditating. She's got this little fez on her head, and she represents Asia. So right over here, the oldest park in New York City, Bowling Green Park. The Dutch started it. This was an area where the Dutch would come out and play. Later on, when the English had it, they established the Bowling Green. This was based on a game of bowls that guys would use, kind of like bocce, where you would roll balls out. So they would do that. That fence is 300 years old. Let's go take a look at it. These newel posts have this uneven top. It looks like somebody hacksawed something off, and they did. They, there were little busts of King George on every one, all the way around. And of course, once the revolution happened, off with his head, there was a huge statue of King George right inside, and they pulled it down. And the story is that they took those, uh, they took that uh, bronze or whatever it was made of. Was it bronze, probably? And they uh, melted those, uh, melted that statue down, and made uh, uh, musket balls to fight King George's men. So uh, let's go through the park over here. Um, so yeah, in this, in this little park right here, and this is, like I said, the oldest and the most famous park in New York City, the Bowling Green. It's in this park that George Washington, and why did George Washington come to New York? Because this was the place to be. This was the most important harbor. He knew that if he was going to engage General Howe, this is where it was probably going to happen, and this is where it happened. Right over on Staten Island, General Howe started amassing his men. Huge buildup. Ships started coming into the harbor at a fantastic rate. Can you imagine living here and just seeing warship after warship? The British Armada was huge and it was powerful. And poor George Washington with his scrappy little band of, you know, these, this, this bunch and that bunch, he puts them all together. And the poor man was freaked out by this. He actually, at one point, the Battle of Long Island happened, the Battle of Brooklyn happened right over on Brooklyn, right across the river here, where General Howe's men came up on the South Shore. George's troops went over to meet him. They fought over there, had a terrible time because George was getting, you know, his, he was getting his comeuppance. He chased them. General Howe chased George back across the river. George was smart enough to, under cover of darkness, come across in every skiff, every boat, every rowboat, every ferry he could get his hands on. And without General Howe even knowing it, moved his entire army back across the East River. And they say that there was a young woman on the other side who was a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous revolutionary, and she, as they say, entertained General Howe on the other side of the river so that he kept his troops there for a day or two longer and gave George a chance to sort of establish himself back over here and start making his way north. But General Howe was not far behind. They came across the river, and there were battles all the way up of this long, skinny island of Manhattan, culminating up with the Battle of Harlem, Battle of Harlem Heights. And uh, that's where George finally got kicked across the Hudson River over to New Jersey and where all of Manhattan was held for the next seven years, the occupation of the British soldiers and where they had the right to, uh, you know, to just come up to your house. They, courted, you know, they, 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 could, they could take quarters in your house. And so it was quite a, quite a time. For the entire seven years of the Revolutionary War, this was a British-held island. Now, the nice thing about this park, and one of the wonderful things about this park that I like is that this is where George Washington unfurled a copy of the Declaration and by the way, when you go to Washington and you see the Declaration of Independence, you know that's just one copy, right? There are many, you guys are historians, most people think that just this one thing, and it apparently just got passed around. There were many copies, and they apparently had, you know, slight differences in all of them. But this is where he unveiled that copy of the Declaration and read it to his men. 
And I think that's pretty cool. That this is that George Washington was here, that he read this to his men, and from that moment on, you know, the, the fun began. And it was, uh, it must have been a tremendously scary but exciting time. Right back here, you guys, is the site of 26 Broadway, the Rockefeller Building. This is where John Davison Rockefeller amassed on your backs and your ancestors' backs millions and millions of dollars, the equivalent of what Bill Gates has today. And you guys probably know as much about the history of John Davison Rockefeller as I do, but basically he decided not just to have all those oil wells, but he figured out how to control the transportation of the oil. He bought up railroads so he could control the transportation of that oil, the production of that oil. But this is where he made all of his money, right here in 26 Broadway. This was his office building. Um, if you look down here, you see these wonderful in, uh, uh, sort of plaques embedded in the sidewalk. They each represent um, the recipient, the recipient of, a, of a ticker tape parade. Have you seen ticker tape parades in magazines and newspapers? This is where they all happen, Lower Broadway. The buildings are so close together, you can open the windows. And back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you would literally throw ticker tape out the window. They had the ticker tape machines. You'd end up with bales of it in your office. And for those one days, you know, for that one day of the parade, they would bring them up in limousines. Thousands of people would line the streets. And out the windows would come this ticker tape, and you'd see this wonderful parade of snow. Nowadays, they use confetti. They use uh, computer paper and everything else. Um, but each time somebody got a parade, they went back and they figured out every one of them, and they put uh, these, uh, what would you call these? They're not plaques, exactly. But they embed in the sidewalk a commemoration for each of those. So look at them as you go up. You'll find some very interesting things, I think. You know, Neil Armstrong, when he walks on the moon, the Yankees when they win the pennant, uh, Will Rogers when he dies with Wiley Post up in Alaska or wherever it was. But they're all commemorated here. Remember Hitler hosted the Olympics in 36, and Jesse Owens just went over and kind of went, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> There's your So this is Broad Street, ladies and gentlemen. And when the Dutch had this area, this whole thing right here, all the way down to the East River, was a big canal. The Dutch loved canals. They loved living on canals. They loved moving goods on canals. They loved walking along canals. So they just got over here and they just built one. Now later when the English took the place over, they just filled the canal in and that was that. It just became Broad Street after that. So right over here you have the New York Stock Exchange. This is where all the Fortune 500 companies uh, trade their stocks. It looks like Campbell's is having some uh, celebration today. I don't know if they've, they what? Well, we don't know. I, I have no idea. If we read the financial pages today, we would have found out, but it could be that they've come up with a new possibility for soup. Maybe they've got tomato cucumber, and because of that, but what happens is oftentimes when the company is issuing a new bunch of stock or there's an IPO or something like that, they'll get special credit outside. They'll get to be uh, celebrated a little bit. So for some reason, and maybe you'll read about it later, Campbell's did something today. Maybe they merged with somebody, but they get to have their banner outside. And probably the Campbell's executives this morning rang the bell to start the trading day, that sort of thing. Let's run up and we'll take a look at the Federal Hall Memorial. Anyway, so behind us here, you guys, is the Federal Hall Memorial. This is on Wall Street. Wall Street is the street right here that, well, originally Peter Stuyvesant, remember that he was the, probably like the fourth Dutch governor. He was the one that really cleaned the place up. He was concerned that we might be attacked by Indians. He was concerned that the British might come down from New England and start to take us over. He wasn't sure, so he decided to build this huge wall. It probably was 15 feet tall with timbers on one side, earth on the other, and uh, it was really kind of pointless. Nobody ever attacked, nobody ever came down. But it was, again, it was just one of those things where we just wanted to make sure, or he just wanted to make sure. Didn't last uh, but a few winters because the firewood, uh, the, the wood uh, used for making the wall was so valuable for firewood that the uh, settlers would just come along and take it, and before long, the wall just fell. But the, uh, the street remained Wall Street. They just kept calling it that. Um, right here is the site of the original New York City Hall. Now, New York was around for, what, 130 years before there was ever a thing called the United States of America. This city was an old dowager by the time there was ever a thing called the United States of America. So as this old thing wanted to help out this young, fledgling federal government, it said, listen, you guys need a place to meet why don't we give you our old city hall? You know, put a couple of fresh coats of paint on it, put a couple of balconies on it, and you'll have yourself what would become Federal Hall. The federal government said, thank you so much. You know, we need to be funded. We need everything we can get our hands on. So they accepted the offer gratefully. It becomes Federal Hall, and it's where your government first sets itself up with George Washington as your president. Now, there are numbers of firsts 
of you know, federal capitals. You guys probably know more about this than I do. But every place where the Continental Congresses were meeting, they would call that the capital of the United States of America. And so there, there were something like 11 of them, 11 towns that came, claimed credit for being the first capital. But I can guarantee you, this was the first one where George Washington ruled as your first president. And it was right about that spot on the original building that George Washington took the oath of office in 1789, 13 years after he had read the Declaration of Independence down there in the park. Isn't that amazing to think about 13 years from the time we declare our independence until the time we actually had our first president? And when I say to middle school kids, that's your entire life. And they go, it's amazing. It takes a long time uh, to form governments, to make things work. Now, how do these governments get formed? It's because people like Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson walked right up and down these streets you know, in the evenings after work. And they would argue, and they would fight, and cajole each other, and try to get each other to understand each other's viewpoint. And, and eventually what happens is we end up with you know, a bicameral form of government. We have two, and then we end up having we have two parties, basically. And those two parties really kind of go back to the idea of the Federalists and the idea of you know, Jefferson and his, his you know, more decentralized sort of government. So I think it's really cool that this is kind of right where it, it all kind of happened. This is where they were all talking and fighting it out. So uh, years later, the Federal Hall just collapses. Well, what happened? The, the Capitol had moved where? Philadelphia. Yeah. And it was just hanging out there until they finished Washington. Once they finished Washington, down they went. Uh, the building here just eventually collapsed. Uh, later, this new building was put up, and it was put up as a sub-treasury building. Actually, it was put up, I, I should say, first as the Customs House, and then it became a sub-treasury building. And then uh, when it was done with that, they just said, you know what, let's just make it now a memorial to what was once there. So now they simply call it the Federal Hall Memorial. And George Washington stays out front. Now, every movie you see about New York, you're going to see this statue. You're going to see some view of it down Broadway or down uh, Wall Street looking toward the Trinity Church, which is going to be our next stop over here. All right. So who did we have here in New York City? We had the English, the British, the aristocracy, the wealthy people. These weren't the, oh, the riffraff, not the Italians, not the Irish, not the Jews, but it was that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant sort of majority, the, the, the sort of like the ruling class. And here they were, originally Anglicans, the Anglican church, and later what? After the revolution, Episcopalians. So this church originally was the Anglican church. Now, it was, as I said, the, the place to be if you were wealthy, if you were a position, in a position of power, if you were part of that established elite. This is your church. It's uh, 300 years old. The, the congregation is 300 years old. This church is the third one on its site, but the congregation goes back 300 years. Uh, so wealthy because Queen Anne had deeded so much land to this church. The land goes from here, several miles north, acres and acres and acres and acres and acres of land that to this day that building there is called the Trinity Building it houses the real estate offices that manage the holdings of this church so I don't know how big your church is but this one's probably bigger and richer um, just real estate offices to deal with all the holdings so their rental properties are phenomenal so this is a very very wealthy church to this day now, uh, later on, of course, churches get bigger in the Protestant faith. And what do you do when your church gets too big? You split yeah, you split up, build a new one down the road. So they do the same thing, and they build down here St. Paul's Chapel. We're going to visit that a little bit later. And um, let's see, a couple of the interesting folks buried in this oldest cemetery in Manhattan over here. Uh, one, Alexander Hamilton, of course, who's one of our one of our great tragic figures of all time because he was so brilliant and was an aide-de-camp to George Washington, was this marvelous young man who comes up from the islands, whose mother is probably a prostitute and probably a person of color, which I find really fascinating. Uh, they've never been able to prove it, but she was a, you know, most likely a prostitute, and if you were in the islands and you were a prostitute, most likely you were a person of color. So I just think that's pretty cool that uh, when you think about Thomas Jefferson and you think about Alexander Hamilton, they, 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 these, these boys got around. So he comes up, he's brilliant, he really has a whole lot to do with uh, setting our financial policies and how the, how the country is going to take off. Uh, George Washington adores him, but what does he do? He gets himself in a fight with Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is a kind of not, not the most honorable sort of man, where Alexander Hamilton was almost a prig in terms of his 
you know, goodness and brilliance. You know, Aaron Burr was just the complete opposite. You know, a real wheeler dealer, builds the Bank of Manhattan, not because he wanted, no, it builds the Manhattan Water Company, not because he wants to have a water company, but because there's a constitutional uh, provision that says you can have a bank if you run a water company. So he starts a water company just so that he can make a bank, you know, things like this. So the two of them are at each other's throats. Finally, in 1804, there's a challenge, there's a duel, and I, I just find this amazing, that even as recently as 200 years ago, it was nothing for me to say, sir, you impugn my honor. You know, I slap your face and you go, you can't do that. I'll, and we have to choose weapons and one of us has to kill each other. That's men for you. That's, you know, it's just, when you think about it, even 200 years, now the thing was, even 200 years ago, you couldn't do it on Manhattan Island. That was considered declasse. So you'd have to go out of town to do it. So they rode across the river to, uh, the Weehawken Cliffs over here on the other side of New Jersey. And uh, Alexander Hamilton said, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to shoot anybody. I'll have to show up. So if you want to kill me, dude, go ahead. And Aaron Burr said, OK. And down he went. He died a slow, painful death. And we lost, in a very early, early age of his life, we lost this brilliant man who God knows what he might have done. Uh, somebody else buried over here is uh, Robert Fulton. You guys know Robert Fulton changed all of our lives by, yeah. He took a steam engine and put it on a boat, and people thought he was crazy. They called it Fulton's Folly, and yet right down, right down here on the river, he uh, puttered that thing all the way up to Albany and all the way back, and our lives were changed forever because of it, because now you did not have to wait for tide nor wind or anything else. If you said you were shipping at 1 o'clock on Friday, you were shipping at 1 o'clock on Friday. So he was, a, he was a brilliant man, married into the Livingston family, and they were a very wealthy and established family. Um, let's see, who else is buried over here? Other declaration, uh, uh, signers of the Declaration are buried here. Gravestones in here go back to the 1680s. So this is, as I said, this is about as, almost as early as you can get in New York City. Uh, uh, I like to think that there is some nice modern architecture and then some mo modern architecture that I'm not crazy about. To give you an idea, of two buildings. Look at this bulk over here. This is the U.S. Steel Building. And see what it feels like in your soul. And then take a look over here at this beautiful building and look at that and tell me what that feels like in your soul. And I, it, I don't know, for me, I've got friends that do like this building, but I find this overbearing. I find it muscular. I find it kind of just in my face. You know, it's just cold and intimidating. And this building, you know, very much the same thing. It's a, it, you know, it's a steel construction, black building, curtain wall, but it just seems so much warmer. It seems to invite you in. It's got this nice sculpture on the ground. So it, it's amazing what architecture can do for you. It's so it, very simple things can make such a difference. Right back behind you there, you can see one of the skyscrapers that I was talking about from that skyscraper race in the 1920s. That's the AIG building, what was originally called the Cities Services Building. And what does it look very much like? Yeah, people mistake it for that all the time. They go, oh, there's the Empire State. Well, no, it looks very much like it, but but you can see how similar all the architecture was, that kind of muscular, very clean, Germanic sort of style. So here outside, you guys, 30 Rockefeller Center. This is the masterpiece. This is the center building, and it's the one that anchors the whole thing. Over here is the skating rink. On the right side, there is the English building. Over here is the French building. Down the middle, the Channel Gardens, because that's what goes between France and England. So they call that the Channel Gardens. We'll walk over there in a second. but. I want you to just look at the magnificent artwork outside here, these beautiful friezes. Um, isn't that great? And that great stylized kind of very, very highly stylized 1930s kind of Art Deco inspired, uh, 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 well, uh, sculpture basically. Friezes, reliefs, they're so lovely. Uh, and this uh, Noguchi actually did one down there on the uh, Associated Press building. It's a beautiful sculpture in aluminum. This is, this is originally what you would have seen. This is that sunken plaza that I talked to you about. And this is where you can see Fifth Avenue over there. In fact, that's Saks Fifth Avenue right there where the flags are. Oh, yeah. So you would be drawn down the ramp, down the Channel Gardens, down here to walk around this beautiful arcade and hopefully look down and say, hey, there's a shop I want to go to. There's a shop. But as I said, people would come out, they would look, and they'd say, that's nice. It's really nice. And keep walking. <laughs> so eventually, they put the skating rink down there, a little skating rink. They had the Olympic skaters floating around. People loved it. People gathered around, especially at Christmas time. It was magnificent. And then they decided, just let's do it all the time. And they rent skates over there. They made the whole thing a skating rink. But of course, most months or a lot of the months of the year, it's just too warm and it just would be too much to keep it cold. But for about seven months of the year, uh, you'll come up and see skaters. And it's just, it's just the most charming thing, especially around Christmas time. Because right over here, where that big medallion is in the pavement there, 
is where a 60 to 80 foot tree stands oh, right there right in front of now we're going to walk down there you're going to get the best pictures right over there in a couple of minutes uh, but that's where the tree is right there there's the statue of prometheus and you'll get a better shot of that over there and then the skaters so it's just an incredible award-winning combination it's just it's just magnificent so um over here is the uh well if you guys saw the olympics from torino some of us call it turin but uh nbc wanted torino so they basically invented that they said we're not going to call it turin which is what you would expect to call it they wanted to sound shishier so they called it torino and so that's why we refer to the olympics there as torino but this was the broadcast booth that they used in um in torino so all your olympics were broadcast from there and uh it replaces temporarily studio 1a which is where the today show normally broadcasts from because once katie left they decided to just fumigate the place clean it up uh clean it all out completely redo the studios and they needed a lot of repair work for a long time so they figured this was a good time to do it before meredith showed up and apparently they're still out here so they haven't quite finished the work yet but once they do this will all be completely cleared out of here and Rockefeller Plaza from the building down there all the way to where it says City 75 up there will be free and open once again. Now this, by the way, is a completely made up road. This has nothing to do with New York City. This is the Rockefeller's private road, which they just, just smashed through the block, three blocks, right? One, two, three, all the way down. And basically they wanted to have their own private road so their executives could come out of this beautiful building and get right into their limos right here. You see what I mean? So it creates a bunch more corner offices and so on. So that's the way they did it. So this is a private road. It has to remain, uh, they have to open it twice a year. And as long as they open it twice a year and let traffic on it, then they can keep it as their private road. So St. Patrick's Cathedral, we just visited before the Trinity Church, upright, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, aristocracy. What were the Irish? The dogs, the dirt the lowest of the low, the people who are treated worse uh, than any other group, save for probably people of color. Um, the Italians weren't, as treated, weren't treated as badly as the Irish. Now, of course, well, they were treated pretty badly, but not so much here because we didn't have so many of them here, but in other parts of the world, yeah, treated, but here, treated just horribly. So the Irish are here, they're here in huge numbers, but they're being treated like dogs. They're getting off the boat and they're being made to go and fight in the Civil War. It's like, wait a minute, I just got here and now, you know, kick me out of one country, bring me to a new country, and now you're making me go and fight the Civil War. They couldn't get jobs. You would see signs saying, no Irish need apply. Irish keep out. You know, on and on and on it would go. So they really had a self esteem problem. There was a particular bishop who decided that enough was enough already and that the Irish were beginning to come into their own. Boss Tweed was starting to court them because he could count on their votes. And he realized, even though he didn't like them, he wanted all those numbers. So he started courting them, started giving them positions. They started to be able to work in the police department. That's why we have this Irish cop stereotype, because it was true. There were more Irish folks on the force than anything else. Fire department the same way. So little by little, these people who were downtrodden, treated like sort of start to find themselves a little bit more powerful and by the 1850s, uh, this, uh, this man, uh, Bishop Hughes, decides he's going to build a cathedral, and it's gonna be a cathedral to knock the socks off of any other church in the city, and he's really gonna establish, as far as I'm concerned, the Irish presence here in New York, and a certain Irish you know, fearlessness and pride uh, in you know, their Catholicism, and uh, they decide to build way out in the middle of nowhere, way uptown. Now, you can see that spire there, 300 feet tall. That's, that's about as tall as the, as the Statue of Liberty from the base all the way to the top of, the, uh, the top of her torch. <laughs> and it doesn't, doesn't look anywhere near like that because you're surrounded by these skyscrapers here, right? It kind of gets lost. But in the 1850s, when they started building this place and they said that these towers were gonna be 330 feet tall, people thought this is gonna be the most amazing thing. Uh, they started building and uh, Mr. Mr. Hughes, uh, Reverend Hughes just went on a, on a prayer he didn't have most of the money that he needed to build the place. I think he needed to have a million and a half dollars by the time they started. I think he had 70,000 pledged. So he just started and they just made it. They just made it work. They just kept raising money and raising money. And before long, they have this incredible church. 
Construction stops during the Civil War because the war is on, there are riots, things are not so good. It resumes, and in about 1892, the church is open, consecrated. Actually, a little bit earlier, 1879, the church is consecrated and ready for, ready for worship. Uh, the Lady Chapel at the end, you can't see it from here, the whole chapel that was added on to the eastern side, and that was to honor the growing importance of Mary in the Catholic Church. So they put the Lady Chapel on it. Um, so let's see, designed by James Renwick, the same fellow that designed the Grace Church downtown, that one we saw earlier. And uh, like I said, just a lovely way of the Irish to really sort of claim themselves, and this is their pride and joy. So. Bam, bam. One of the uh, most remarkable features that the uh, tour guide pointed out to us uh, pertains to uh, the design of the fountain itself, the theme of the fountain itself, and uh, just a little bit of the history behind the fountain. Uh, as you look at the fountain, it's actually uh, based on a scripture from the Bible uh, that pertains to the Pool of Bethesda. And in the Pool of Bethesda, uh, it was, of course, legend that anyone uh, who managed to enter the pool at the time in which it was believed that an angel appeared and troubled the water, uh, then of course whomever was in the pool at that time uh, was healed. And of course uh, the story comes to us by way of the scriptures and uh, it was where blind Bartimaeus was healed. Uh, as it takes its place in Central Park, uh, we're told that uh, it's here now for those who are weary walkers, uh, those who have had a long day and are seeking to be refreshed and seeking to be healed, uh, that basically they'll come here, they'll either wash their hands uh, in the pool or perhaps even take their shoes off and uh, place their feet in the pool. So uh, certainly it's a beautiful um, piece of architecture, beautiful fountain. And one of the main things that I want you to notice as it pertains to the le legend and the statue is that the angel's uh, foot is positioned in such a way whereas she is, of course, uh, placing her feet in the water as well. Now the conservatory was going to be a huge greenhouse and this was going to be you know, the typical steel and glass construction. They ran out of money, so what do they do? 
they decide to build a pond and they call it the conservatory waters and they're basing it on paris and parisian parks where model boat building was a very big thing and where they love to sail boats so right behind me here is the krebs boat house curbs boat house and uh, just inside you can see incredible models of 12 meter yachts of uh, fire boats of all kinds of sailboats and if you come out on a sunday afternoon you'll see them racing all over the park out here. They actually have regattas, they have sailboat races. And by the way, these boats are actually being sailed just the way you would sail a regular boat. There's a main sail and a main sheet, and there's a rudder. And so you're actually controlling with radio control the main sheet and the rudder just like you would an actual sailboat. You know, it's not like there's a, a propeller and there's a rudder and whatever, and all you have to do is you know just pretty much steer the thing. You're actually sailing and so uh, you're tacking and going around the, you know, the various buoys and everything, and it's, it's just really incredible. Anyway, they're about to open it up, so I might take a look. Well, these boats are owned by various model makers and, uh, and hobbyists who live here in New York. Some come from out of town, um, but you can see the workmanship on these things is just incredible. Now, some of them are just training boats, uh, very inexpensive that guys are going to use just to learn how to sail. Some of them are made by master model makers, model builders, who have you know, spent hours and hours, you know, perfecting these designs. And I just think it's such a colorful place, and uh, I just love, you know, great craftsmanship like that, and I thought people would appreciate seeing it. So, anyway. In, in Olmstead has a place in American history in the textbook in that you've had a couple of sentences that said that, you know, he designed Central Park. Um, it was a major feat for the day. <laughs> And it doesn't really, until you come actually see Central Park, those two sentences do not take on a whole, a whole lot of meaning. It's just a little fact that you, you say you gloss over it and you're finished and done. But when you actually come to the park that is in the middle of New York, and even though there's traffic and even though there's a lot of people around, it's a calm, it's a peaceful um, place. It's probably a place for people in New York to get away, but those two sentences in that history book take on a whole new meaning and a whole new perspective once you've seen it and you've felt what the park feels like. I'm here in what was originally Germantown in New York in front of the Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum is actually, was actually a residence built in 1863 on 97 Orchard Street. And what the museum offers is a look inside the life of people who actually inhabited this structure. Um, when you first come in the building, it's not as bad as you might expect. You've got some wonderful tin ceilings, a mahogany staircase, and most of the items in the vestibule are in their original condition, but they still look really nice. What is shocking probably to most people is the conditions upstairs in which people had to live in. You either had windows in the front of your home or in the back of your home. And depending on when the, where those windows were, you might have had to smell sewage um, if those windows were open. So as you can imagine, ventilation was pretty poor. Uh, living conditions were very bad. They were, uh, these, each of these apartments were probably more or less 300 to 350 square feet. And you may have had a family of four, five, six sharing those four walls. 350 square feet, 320 square feet, imagine that. That's about half the size of the average classroom. As far as I'm concerned, I think of the West Village as from here kind of over. Although back in the 50s, the Washington Square Park area where we just were was considered kind of the epicenter of the village. That's where it was more Jack Kerouac and uh, uh, those kind of guys, the beat generation would hang out over there. So let's go back to the 1820s. New York City is growing by leaps and bounds. Downtown conditions are so crowded. And when I say downtown, what do I mean? Where were we yesterday? Down at the very tip of the islands. That's where, remember, that's where they, the, all, the, all the, uh, the settlement started. Keeps moving farther and farther north. Now, things are getting crowded. Conditions are not great. Sanitation is terrible. People are living on top of each other. 
uh, people are really having a hard time with the wells. Fresh water is getting rougher and rougher. Sewage, please. So what happens? Disease runs wild. It's fetid, it's hot, it's miserable. And wealthier people start to say, you know what, we got to get out of town. We got to go north. We've got to go to that little suburb some people are talking about, that little town way north of here called Greenwich. Uh, people have gone up there, they've settled, there's some farming going on, and we've got some money. Let's, let's go up there, let's rent a house, let's build a house. So the rich start moving up. They start taking their carriages, they start coming up the Hudson River on their boats and pulling in right down at the base of this street, right down at the end at the, on the Hudson River. And they start to develop, they start to settle, they start to make this place bigger and bigger because they want to get out of and escape the horrible city, which is way down south where we were yesterday. Little by little, it grows and grows. More and more people start moving up. Before long, uh, a street that used to be called something else is now called Commerce Street because there's so much uh, business along it. Another street is called Bank Street, just up the way here because there are so many banks along it now. Uh, the place is building, the place is growing. Uh, Greenwich, uh, to say Greenwich Village is actually kind of redundant because which, W-I-C-H, is actually a Dutch term for a small town. So it's almost like Greenwich is enough. You don't have to say, it's like the hoi polloi. It's just hoi polloi is enough. So um, the place starts, this place starts growing. Throughout the 19th century, it gets bigger and bigger. Downtown is moving farther and farther north. Before long, they just kind of meet. And now it's just sort of a neighborhood. Um, so where does, where does Greenwich Village, as we know it, really start to become Greenwich Village? It's the 1910s. This is when Greenwich Village starts to become this place that certain people said they couldn't live their lives anywhere else except Greenwich Village because this was progressive, this was radical, this was anarchy, this was where people <clears throat> could think thoughts, could dream dreams, could write their novels, could paint their paintings, could come up with political movements. It's where Margaret Sanger walked around talking about birth control. It's where Emma Goldman walked around lecturing and leafleting about anarchy. It's where uh, Floyd uh, Dell came from the Midwest and talked about radical ideas. It's where um, Max Eastman started a magazine called The Masses. And many of you probably don't remember it, but a lot of you know The New Yorker, which started in 1925. Max Eastman says, as far as he's concerned, Harold Ross, who started The New Yorker, took his lead from his magazine, The Masses. It was the first time in a magazine you had pictures, stories, cartoons, light pieces, but it was very radical. This was the era and the time of John Reed, who wrote uh, that wonderful book, 10 Days That Shook the World, about the 1917 revolution in Russia. And if you saw the movie Reds, if you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful movie to see, and it's about John Reed, about his girlfriend. And uh, it was literally filmed right on the street. So Warren Beatty was, you know, one day I was doing a tour, and Warren Beatty was right down there walking around. This was, not, I wasn't doing a tour, I'm sorry. This was 1980. I was just riding my bike around, and I got to take a few pictures of him. So think of this place as off the grid. Remember, the grid started up at 14th Street. I didn't say that the other day, but that's kind of where it started, up north. Over here, because there had been so many farms over here, and when you get rid of your farm, what do you do? You sell the land off, and you're going to subdivide, right? So you're going to put a bunch of streets in. So you put a bunch of streets in, you subdivide it. People will, well, now the neighbor north of you decides to sell his big piece of property. So he puts a bunch of streets in, sells them, subdivides them. Now, little by little, it becomes a city. So now you've got to start to connect all these crazy streets that you've put in. And that's kind of why Greenwich Village is noted for all of these winding, wonderful streets. Because of that, as the place grows up, it becomes very easy to get lost here. And because of that, it's kind of a mysterious sort of place. Because of that, artists tend to move in here. Writers tend to move in here. You can get lost in here. And I think that was the idea. That's where these ideas got nurtured. It was kind of like a little Petri dish for new ideas, for revolutionary thought. And um, so that was the 1910s, the 1920s. Up into the 1950s, you get the beatniks who come in here, and they've got their, you know, their wild hair. Into the 1960s, it's the political movements, it's the women's movement that's really taking, or the, the revival of the women's movement, because the women's movement really started back in the 1910s. Um, it was, uh, who's the famous poet, uh, Edmund St. Vincent Millay, who said, I came to Greenwich Village because this was the only place that I could be the woman I wanted to be. It was called the New Woman's Movement. So the idea of being a new woman was being modern, sort of unshackling yourself from the Victorian ideas, you know, and actually getting to have some thoughts and ideas and live your own life. And this was considered radical. This was crazy, you know, that you would not choose to have a husband or you would choose not to have children. This was, this had never been thought of, you know, not, not that it had never been thought of before, but this was pretty radical stuff. 
So they came here uh, later on in the 60s, uh, as I said, the new women's movement. In the 70s, the gay liberation movement happens here. Um, uh, Christopher Street is kind of a center for gay liberation. It's a little bit farther up from here. Uh, so it has always had this wonderful sense of promise, a wonderful sense of uh, things happening, ideas, writers writing, uh, happenings, plays. This is actually, and we'll, we'll try to walk by if we can, the Cherry Lane Theater, which was kind of the, uh, kind of you could almost consider it the, the birth of the off-Broadway movement. You know, up until that point, if you were going to do a show, you'd be up on Broadway. For the first time, someone said, you know what, we could just, we could just, you know, we, I got a barn, we could do a show. It was almost like that. And for the first time, uh, Eugene O'Neill, if you guys have read Eugene O'Neill plays, his plays were here performed for the first time. They would go, the Provincetown players were in Provincetown and out on Cape Cod. And then they, they would come back to the city in the winter and they put together the Provincetown Theater and would do plays. So all here in Greenwich Village. So that gives you kind of a, kind of an overview. But let's just go take a look at some of the old houses. Anyway, just a word about this, um, this architecture here. Um, the earliest houses in New York were Quonset huts. That's the ones the Indians had. And on and on it goes. We come up to the federal period. This is the, this is the period in the um, 1700s, uh, sorry, the uh, later part of the 18th century, called the federal style. We have a new country and very simple houses. Uh, they have dormers on the top, but they're row houses just like they are in England because that's where we're taking our cue from. But the next generation of houses, 1830s, 1840s, becomes what was called uh, the, uh, the New Greek style or the Greek Revival style. And the Greeks have had their revolution, it's the 1820s, and in, and in sort of in solidarity with the Greeks, we're thinking, yeah, let's go back to this. So we have these beautiful houses here, and this becomes the style that you're going to see in so many of the row houses in New York, the Greek Revival. Uh, you see a very simple, very plain front. You see a little pediment over the doorway. Uh, a lot of times you'll see columns on both sides because columns are very Greek. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We're probably keeping uh, we're probably keeping somebody up, so I'm going to talk a little bit softer. So, um, what you have here with a house like this? This is a single family house. Remember what we said? This is where the middle class lived. This is this wasn't for rich people. This was just a middle class house. You had the parlor level, which is up above, a uh, stoop leading up to the parlor level, and that's where you'd entertain. That's where you would go if anybody, any fancy guests were coming over. Now, do we have uh, alleyways in New York City? No, you don't. So how do we how do we get deliveries made? How do we, normally everything would come in the back door. Where's the back door? Right underneath, yeah. So that's not the cellar level, that's the basement level. The cellar is below the basement. So here's the basement level, and that's where you're going to have all your informal friends come over. That's where all the workmen are going to come in. But if you have a nice affair or you're having Sunday dinner, everyone's going to go up the main stairway and go up to the parlor level there. Uh, above the parlor level, you had various you know, bedrooms, chambers, and libraries, or whatever else you wanted. Oftentimes, the kitchen was right in the rear of the parlor level, and there might be a dining room there as well. So uh, yeah, so the back door of your house is actually on the front. Now, what happens as time goes by? Can people afford to have a big house like this, a single family? No way. So it gets divided up. So you start now to see them dividing these things up. And what happens? The first thing that comes off is the stoop. So look at this house over here on the, do you see the um, drain pipe coming down there? Do you see the discoloration of the brick? There's where a stoop used to be. Now, under number 38, they simply use the back door as the front door. Here, you still have the stoop. And if this house ever got sold, or they ever decided to transfer it over. But you're going to see that constantly. They, they pull the whole stoop off, they divide the apartments up, and now you've got an apartment probably on every floor. This was owned by a man named William Hyde. He was a, he was a sash maker. Oh, uh, loved to you know, build windows, and he sold them. And you can see his house has numbers of them. And if you look right around the back, as we go by here, you can see his workshop in the back. Uh, so just remarkably, and thank goodness, this one survived. And uh, although it's not the oldest one here, that's down the road a little piece, it's pretty darn nice. So um, see here a street curving down, you can see this street coming this way and that. It has this real nice sense of, you know, people have a very hard time even to this day. I mean, I was here for years before I really felt comfortable walking around here because you just don't know where you're going. It's really interesting that way. Anyway, to start a discussion about the World Trade Center, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, well, first of all, it's a very interesting and different day since it's the fifth anniversary, but I'm going to treat it pretty much like I would treat it with any other group, which is to say that um, you guys all lived through it. I lived through it. You had your own experiences. I had my experiences. 
anything that you want answered about, I guess, the physical day itself, you can find in Time Life books, you can find in countless you know, four color periodicals, you can find in newspapers, you can find in movies. You can see what went on that day, you can learn all that stuff. It was gruesome, you can imagine how terrible it was to think that people had to literally decide to stay or jump. You know, it was, it was just beyond what we need to talk about. But that's between you and your makers. And just like going to a grave site, we don't have to, you know, talk too much. Uh, so how you decide to spend the next half hour or so is up to you. What I'm gonna do is just talk a little bit about some of some of the you know, sort of the facts and figures, and then I'm going to relate a couple of stories that uh, that I like to relate some very very happy and pleasant memories of myself, as though we were at a wake and we were eulogizing something that we lost that we loved. And uh, I, I probably will tear up because it's hard for me to to not when I'm here. Some of you might, and I think it's just you know it's just part of being human, because we lost so many folks that day, and it's so it was so much a part of. Uh, uh, the city and I took, you know, for 15 years I took middle school kids and high school kids here. Uh, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. First thing is size. Size of two towers. This place was developed and built by the folks who were wealthy. The Rockefeller family, for example. They wanted to build a big center down here. Well, they'd already built, you can just barely see it back there, the Chase Manhattan Plaza. And it was a way of saying to the city, we're not moving uptown. The financial district is staying right down here. And here's what we're going to do to prove it to you. We're going to put a 65-story tall building up here. We're going to call it Chase Manhattan Plaza. David Rockefeller was, of course, the youngest Rockefeller brother. And he was the chairman of Chase. So um, that was one way of saying it. And then they also said, let's put together a World Trade Center. This was in the 1950s. They were planning. They were thinking about it. And finally, it got off the ground. Numbers of different plans over there, over here. Finally, they, they decide to put it over here. Uh, they destroy an entire neighborhood, but that's eminent domain for you. You know, for the for the better good, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're going. Them is them is patriots, by the way, on their on their Harleys. So they're. Uh, I think it's like all Harley Day. Whenever there's a like a patriotic event, it's always those guys on their bikes. So anyway, they decide to build, they come over here, and it is decided that this building, this complex, is going to hold 10 million rentable feet of storage, uh, of uh, rental space. 10 million square feet. Now, to give you an example, the Empire State Building, which I said last night was the biggest building ever in the world for 40 years, has about 2 million rentable square feet of office space. This was going to have five times that. So in addition to two towers, there were, you know, there were uh, five more outlying buildings, and then there were five levels underground, 16 acres on the whole site. So you can imagine just how big this was. Underground shopping, underground parking, underground transportation, uh, a lot of the physical, you know, the mechanicals of the whole place. But this place could have held very easily 50,000 people, 60,000 people on a, on a normal work day. And of course, 9-11, that's what we were all concerned with. We were all thinking, my God, how many are in there and how many will be able to get out and how many won't be able to get out? But just understand, we were extremely lucky that so few people died. So many more could have so easily. So that was a good thing. Um, so these two towers, they're going to go up higher and higher and higher and higher and it's considered insanity. The architect himself didn't want to make them above 80 floors. He said it was crazy. But of course, it's the men, the powers that be, that want them to go higher and higher and higher. So to give you an idea, take a look at the U.S. Steel Building here. Now, you know what I'm going to say. Photoshop it. Copy and paste another one right on top of that one. Twice that size. Twice that size. Now, take that, do a control all and then copy and paste that because you're going to put two of those right next to each other and that's just the towers. That's not the other five buildings. That's not number seven which came down at five o'clock in the afternoon and no one even remembers because it was five o'clock in the afternoon. Who could remember such a thing after we've lost the two big ones? It's a, you know, that alone would have been a major, a major disaster and yet we don't even remember it because of how overshadowed it was by the first two let alone the other four buildings, five buildings, let alone everything underneath. Uh, it went down, you know, five, six, seven stories, 
and the rubble pile was up above ground level five stories. So in other words, 10 or 12 stories of compressed World Trade Center. That's a lot of garbage over 16 acres. Can you imagine the size of that pile? Hard to believe. And when you think of the number of man hours and women hours that went into constructing all of that and putting it all up, it, that's, you know, the, the loss of life breaks your heart the most, and that's the biggest by a long shot. Second for me is anytime something is built, you know, if somebody builds a table and it gets burned up in a fire, I cry a tear. If somebody put their heart and soul into that table, somebody polished it, somebody cut the dowels, somebody glued it and, you know, made something, and then it gets destroyed. Can you imagine the pride? Can you imagine building this thing? It was, it was the, you know, it had to be one of the biggest construction projects of all time. You know, I don't know the exact, you know, statistics about that, but I would come down after dark, I would sneak my way onto the site, and I would see, for example, a beam that was longer than that bus, as tall as this, and with huge nuts and bolts lining the entire thing. And that beam, it's as though you just took a cardboard tube and just twisted it like that. And they would lift every one of those beams up, every piece of that got lifted up, put on a flatbed truck, and hauled away to be x-rayed. But as I looked at that big, gnarled beam and every one of those bolts and nuts, I thought of the worker who took that bolt out of his pocket, who tapped that, you know, that bolt through, put that, and that was just the tiniest little bit. Years and years and years of construction, of work, of vision, and uh, the whole thing goes in just about an hour. So that's how big, that's how tall, that's how crazy. Each one of the floors of those towers had one acre of rentable space. You know how big an acre is. Every one of those 110 floors on this side and 110 floors, so 210 acres of rentable space just in the two towers. So pretty amazing what we lost that day. One of the sad things for me is that I don't think most people in the country quite understood what we lost that day, aside from the human life. I think that most people had one thing to reference, and that was Oklahoma City. When you think about it, Oklahoma City, the other major attack, where 100 people died and a 10-story building had one side of it collapse. And I was in Georgia, and I can tell you that that's what people were thinking. They had no idea. This was a town. This was, a ma this was you know, a, a major city in some parts of the country that just was destroyed in an hour. So hard for anybody to have a reference point. And that's why I wanted to just give you some sense of what it was like. So when you see those pictures, when you see that smoke billowing, it's the most remarkable thing that more people were not killed, that it was on a huge plaza that absorbed so much of the energy as it came down. Imagine if it was in the middle of town where we were yesterday where the Empire State Building was. Can you imagine the collateral damage around? It would have been terrible. Anyway, we could talk more, but let's go over. We'll pay our respects, say a couple of more things, and then uh, get on ourselves back uptown, okay? So just a couple of stories. So this, this, is, the, this is the 16 acre site behind me here. Uh, so just a, uh, just a couple of quick stories by way of eulogizing this beloved old uh, kind of cranky uncle, this kind of bizarre architecture, this, this two completely outscaled, outsized buildings. They didn't belong here. They were completely out of scale. You know, they stuck up like two sore thumbs. Nobody liked them. You'll never see them mentioned in any serious architecture journal. They were just completely, you know, just, just, just looked at as, as kind of a joke. And yet, over the course of the years, everyone started to fall in love with them because they just became part of the culture and part of the, you know, part of the, the whole fabric of New York City. I describe them sometimes as that kind of, kind of grumpy old uncle who you don't really like, but you wouldn't want to have Christmas without him. It wouldn't be the same, you know. So um, there they stood. So let's see. One thing is uh, Philippe Petit. He's a circus performer in the 60s. He is in Paris, and uh, he is fascinated by tightrope walking, and he tightrope walks all over Europe between great towers, between church towers, and he becomes obsessed with the, with the World Trade Centers when they start going up. He starts collecting everything he can collect on them, and you know where this is going. He decides that he is going to tightrope walk between the two towers. And uh, before they're even completed, he has assembled, uh, assembled a team, he has paid off contractors, he's paid off security people. He has assembled a group of 20 or so people. They've brought winches, they've brought cables, 
uh, under cover of darkness. They sneak into the buildings with you know hard hat uniforms, and uh, so they look like workers. And the superintendents are simply turning their backs. The security people are simply turning their backs. They have a coordinated effort with radios going up both towers all the way to the top. They have a crossbow to shoot the first rope across to start to bring the second cable across, to start to bring the final and biggest cable across. Uh, they set winches up that are very big. They've got to be cemented. Uh, they've got to be clamped down to the iron, iron uh, uh, you know, girders. And uh, finally, uh, the wind is judged just right. And it, ooh, I think we better get out of the way here for this gentleman to come out. And uh, they decide the wind is right. The guys give him the go ahead. And the plan is for him just to walk across 1,360 feet from one tower to the other. Gets out there, and he feels so comfortable and so confident that he decides that he's going to stay out there for 45 minutes. And that's what he does. He jumps. He lays down. He cavorts. He smiles. He gives New York City such a show. Now, it's very, very early in the morning, so not that many people got to see it. Uh, but the cable stayed up for a long time, and it was covered, of course, on all the news, you know, the newspapers and all the, the TV and radio stations. This was 1974, and I remember it very well. It was amazing. So uh, Philippe Petit used to come into the bike shop that I worked at, and I got the thrill of, you know, telling him, hey, I know you, I love you, you're amazing. He goes, you know, and I said, yes. And I used to get to work on his unicycle. So uh, that's my little connection to Philippe Petit. 1977, George Willig is a young man who's a toy designer in New York City. He works for Mattel, and he is a fabricator, so he can make all sorts of little things. And he goes over and he measures the uh, window washing gondola grooves that are in the side of the building. And, uh, and he goes home and he creates for himself a couple of ascenders. He's a technical climber, so he knows how to make uh, ascenders. This is a thing that can slide up but won't slide back down. So one morning early on, he goes over, puts himself in his rock climbing harness, has a, you know, a, a thing here and a thing here, and he slides himself all the way up the side of that building, this, the human fly, they called him, 110 stories. The cops tried to come down on the gondola to get him. When he did, he just pulled himself over and stood on one foot so they couldn't get him. And he makes it all the way to the top finally, and they arrest him and throw him in jail. And then you know, eventually, of course, he's released and has dinner with the mayor, and he's a, he's a great hero. So I love, just love stories like that. Like in New York, there's always something like that going on. People have to try to top themselves. And so lots and lots and lots of wonderful memories of this place, of showing young people this place. Of uh, uh, My brother worked in the building for some time. I had a couple of friends who were in the building. When the planes hit, they fortunately got out alive. Uh, number seven, that just gorgeous building there. Talk about beautiful modern architecture. That, to me, is about as good as it gets. That's number seven. Uh, World Trade, gleaming, gleaming in the sunshine there. That's number seven. That's the first building that has gone up on the site. Number seven was the tower that went down at five in the afternoon that we don't even remember. Uh, now, it's not on the 16-acre site. It's across the street, but it was still considered part of the World Trade Center site. So uh, what they're doing now is they're still trying to figure out what to do about the memorial, about the memorial tower that's going to be there, about what you know arts organizations are going to be there. Everybody has a different story. Everybody has a different need. So it's pretty tricky. Chief of the Fire Department, I'm the Battalion Commander of uh, the 9th Battalion, uh, right here on uh, West 48th Street and 8th Avenue in Midtown. Five years ago, on 9 11, uh, we lost all 14 of them. Can anybody hear me? I'm a civilian. I'm trapped. 
service we have to stay focused make sure that um, the guys uh, learn what they need to learn to stay safe to keep each other safe and uh, and to keep the people in the city of New York safe you know we do that day in and day out and, and uh, they understand what their uh, what their job is and, uh, and, and you know you have to uh, stay focused and, and, uh, and do it husband Paul Michael Benedetti we love you and we miss you every day and you're always in our hearts Sandra Patricia Campbell Thank you. 